<laughs> Thanks, Michael, and kia ora koutou. Uh, I am Matthew Plummer, and uh, until recently I was based in the art history program at Victoria University, uh, and a couple of months ago I moved to the IT program, um, the IT uh, services, I should say. And I think it's a sign of the time that you can actually move from art history to IT. Um, and my talk today will really uh, bridge both those fields to some extent, uh, looking particularly at a... Uh, um, an image management system that we have attempted to uh, develop over the last few years. Um, I've added a question mark to my presentation, uh, partly in response to sort of um, ideas that have been circulating around at this conference, um, partly wanting to acknowledge the fact that um, that sometimes uh, you know it's better to sort of ask a question and then assert an answer, and that there's an element of um, uh, I guess, subjectivity as to whether the project that I'm going to be talking about is a success or a failure. In fact, uh, I think whether this is a cautionary tale or a really enthusing and encouraging project is a litmus test for <coughs> your willingness to engage in these kinds of things. Um, also, just to sort of provide a little caveat that um, I came on board in this project somewhat after its inception, so I'll be using the term we and I uh, to talk about this project, sometimes even though I wasn't involved at the stage, just for convenience sake. Okay, so tailor-made, what's the advantage of tailoring? Well, um, to be reminded of the importance of good tailoring, I think, we need to look no further than Mad Men's protagonist, Don Draper. Consistently decked out in an impeccably tailored suit, Ad Man Draper's product pitches are frequently compelling, in part because Draper himself is a premium product, an invented identity, an adopted persona. Draper, you see, is actually Dick Whitman, and the tailored suit acts as the equivalent of a superhero's outfit, helping transform a down and out loser into an advertising superstar. From a certain point of view, Don Draper might be the most compelling case for the argument that it's the clothes that make the man and not the other way round. Now, regardless of whether you agree with me or not on this point, I think it's fair to say that the importance of a good fit, be it a suit or a software system, is difficult to overstate. Now, the questions I hope to tackle in this talk um, are threefold. Firstly, to what extent might open source options allow for a tailored fit for institution software solutions? Secondly, can these options trump off the rack one size fits all offerings? And what are the pros and cons of each approach? And to address these questions, I'll be using this case study that I've already uh, mentioned earlier. One that has been in development uh, at VUW since 2011. Um, when I pitched the idea for this talk earlier in the year, my hope, if not my expectation, was that by, this by the time this conference arrived, I'd have a fully operational system to demonstrate. Uh, but like grand designs, good tailoring, it seems, takes time and sometimes no short measure of drama. So it's probably not too much of a spoiler to reveal that the system, while inching closer every day to uh, a demonstration-ready state, is in fact still in development. Um, uh, to put it more bluntly, three years and counting after its inception, it might easily be considered a failure. So I was greatly buoyed by Andy Neal's opening remarks yesterday. They seemed to point a way, uh, to a way in which failure might be embraced, especially if it was the result of being bold, as I believe is the case here. And I was further encouraged by a number of speakers who touched on the benefits of being able to aggregate content across a range of databases something which the system seeks to accommodate. So in addition to embracing failure and being bold, another mantra that I've picked up from this conference is keep calm and, ag and aggregate content. I made a pact with myself um, that I'd never jump on this bandwagon, but here I am breaking it just for you today. So let's, without further ado, have a bit of a look at the system. And um, as I'm sure many of you know, um, stories such as developing a new kind of uh, digital system often begin with a technology trigger. And this, and this system was no exception. So for a number of years uh, in the art history department, um, the, resource, the resources that we were used were catalogued um, using uh, Vernon's content management system. But by the time uh, 
uh, Sarah Kayla uh, was uh, appointed as a visual resource administrator in 2011. This uh, very antiquated late 90s version of Vernon, to be separated from later versions, um, was well and truly kind of end of life. Um, and what she realised was that um, because the cataloguing uh, system that we're using was kind of antiquated, you couldn't copy and paste into certain fields, the metadata system was out of date, that there was a culture that had developed of ad hoc cataloguing and often uh, inconsistent and infrequent cataloguing if it was done at all. Um, it also be, had become a security risk because the server was uh, running on Windows 2000 and the security patches were no longer available. So there was clearly a need to update. Um, and another key piece of functionality that um, was desired was the ability to publish content to the web from this content management system, something that, that wasn't available. Um, uh, a result was that we had all these silo collections, a whole lot of academics, art history staff had collections on their personal drives that were unable to be searched um, by others. There were limited funds to purchase a new system, to develop an off, off the sort of off-the-shelf option. Um, and where there was funding was really in staff overhead, so there was some operating expenditure, expenditure um, but not enough money to say buy the latest version of Vernet's. Um, and there was also additional complexity because there was uh, the perceived need for the system to cater not only to the needs of art history teaching staff, but also the Adam Art Gallery, who are responsible for cataloguing and maintaining the university art collection. So what we were really hoping to get um, uh, was a system which could tick both those boxes, be a great uh, teaching tool, uh, learning and research tool, and also a, a museum cataloguing tool, which has extra requirements like uh, you know, insurance fields and granular access, these kinds of things. Um, Sarah did an analysis of existing options within the university uh, at the time, and while we had a Piction database, it was quite quickly uh, uh, realised that that wasn't going to cut the mustard in terms of the functionality that we required. So, what was the solution? Um, Sierra architected this rather bold vision to create a bespoke system uh, utilising two open source software packages and develop an interface between them. If only it was as easy as plugging two chords together. Um, and so a little bit more about these two systems that I've mentioned. Um, one was MDID3, which is developed by the James Madison University in the States. And it's a digital image database which has quite a wide range of functionality. And it's been used for uh, a number of different purposes. Um, and one of the key things that uh, we are uh, sort of attracted to, uh, attracted to it um, was the fact that it's a content aggregator so that you could pull in different databases and configure them in different ways and it's all open source. Um, similarly, Collective Access is an open source cataloging tool. It's quite widely used in the uh, museum sector uh, and uh, has, uh, you know, a wide range of customization. We could implement whatever control vocabularies we wanted and so the idea was, why not use these two systems? There's no upfront costs, they're free, they're open, and let's develop some connectivity between them. So we started to look at some different uh, databases around the place that we might utilize, some much more easily than others, and particularly um, Digital New Zealand and Art Store APIs were very user friendly for the developers. Um, there's also the pos possibility to port in other systems. Um, and the functionality of MDID as a sort of dedicated teaching resource was really appealing. Um, collective Access provided a method uh, in which we could catalogue a range of different systems, a range of different information, uh, and could also publish to the web. And then we just had to find a way to link all these things together, um, particularly focusing on this connectivity between MDID and Collective Access. So how did we go about this? Bearing in mind that we had no money, uh, or little money. So the funding that we got um, was from a, a series of learning and teaching development grants. Um, so rather than sort of pulling money from our limited school resources, we were able to tap into sort of the, the wider community pool of funds for innovative projects such as this. Uh, and we employed engineering and computer science students. Um, Initially, uh, they, there was a course called Software Engineering 302 that the students uh, worked on sort of this, this system 
in class, and then we employed some over the summer of 2011, 2012, to sort of see what they could do in the space. Um, and what they did was that they arrived at a sort of proof of concept point developing the system in their own environment in the engineering and computer science labs. Uh, and uh, they also did some customization to um, improve the functionality, uh, particularly replacing the federated searching that M did uh, previously used with United Searching Capabilities. And so I guess when I'm talking about tailor-made, this is particularly the areas I'm talking about. A, bringing together two different open source software packages to talk to one another, and also in trying to improve uh, and increase the functionality of those systems, um, utilizing the skills of our captive developing crew. Um, I should also point out that it may be obvious, but um, as a university, our IT program isn't really a development program or of support, so we were able to use um, engineering and computer science students who had those skills. So what were the customizations? I thought this uh, beautiful Litchfield suit sourced from Digital New Zealand might be a, a nice visual marker. Um, I thought the best way to sort of uh, pitch, particularly that customization of the searching um, was best sort of put in the words of Rodrigo de Silva, who's the key student developing the software himself. And he writes, the idea behind utilizing United Search as opposed to Federated Search was to increase code reuse and decrease the amount of work necessary to update or add a new, engines, new search engines to the server. When implementing United Search, we extracted the items which were repeated in each engine and placed them in a location which allows more centralized control. This makes full use of the fact that many search engines essentially contain the same methods and also reduces the amount of time spent searching for certain methods when upgrading. Um, and so this enabled specific search as possible, bridging um, the difference between available search engines and terms. Um, and as he says, it's a simple system, but it's effective allowing the maximum depth and breadth of search for each engine. Sounds great, right? I mean, if you think about some of the ideas that Mia was talking about in the closing keynote address yesterday, uh, this idea of trying to aggregate content in the most efficient manner, trying to get to that highest common denominator. Um, this is some of the customization that seemed to facilitate this. Um, and of course, being open source, we can also contribute um, these imp improvements, customizations back to a community. Um, the branches are up on GitHub um, and have attra attracted some interest from other people uh, in this area. Um, however, it's by no means been plain sailing and teething issues, I would say, doesn't really begin to um, discover it, to cover it in some ways. So while we got proof of concept over that initial summer project, um, getting it installed on an ITS production environment proved to be somewhat more problematic. Um, and unfortunately, the interface that was developed between Collective Access and MDID has been, shall we say, temperamental at times. Um, this is a, a basic overview of the kind of map of the system. Uh, this is the, the server which is hosting the two software sources. Uh, to get this set up took over a year. And this was mainly due to various issues um, that we're not entirely privy to. Um, it took an incredible amount of time to get the server up that we could then try and uh, port in the code that the students had developed. Um, and during this time, we also had three different visual resources administrators overseeing the project. Um, it's a half, half full-time position. I was the, th the third of these. And so um, th that, that's presented issues for continuity. Um, there have been sort of customizations or emphasis placed on the project over that time that reflect the differing emphasis and biases and sort of priorities of each of those people. Um, if we were to start this project again today, uh, Victoria, I think, would be much more able to accommodate this kind of, uh, this kind of system. Um, and what we're looking to do in ITS now is to have this kind of three-tiered model, uh, starting with a chaotic sandpit where, um, I guess somewhat similar to the uh, ECS students' work in their labs, create an environment where there's pretty much no security, where it's quarantined from main systems, um, where it's a chance to experiment um, play around, see what you can come up with, and then uh, do security testing, uh, test different options for integration, and try and get this healthy hothouse environment with the idea being that a disciplined engine room and an enterprise level solution will result. Um, and in order to sort of help facilitate this, we've also um, uh, 
created a new position in IT as an e-research specialist who has some coding experience and is able to sort of help uh, implement this model. However, this model wasn't there when we were done it uh, originally. So we've been a bit of a victim of being ahead of the curve. Um, recently, we decided uh, for a number of different reasons that um, let's try this out in the cloud. Let's see how quickly it would be to implement this system in the cloud um, and sort of use that as an innovation incubator, creative uh, chaotic sandpit type space. Um, and it took us less than a week to get this running up on Amazon Web Services versus the year that it took to get a, a virtual machine uh, in the ITS production environment. Um, obviously, we had the benefit of already doing a lot of work to get it into that environment, but it's quite amazing how much more uh, efficient and quick it was to do this. Um, being in the cloud has enabled a lot of flexibility and freedom in that the uh, coders have complete admin rights over the server. They can control what sort of uh, versions of the programming they're using, um, what types of operating system they're using, and so on and so forth. Um, those things are a bit more locked down in an ITS production environment. Um, uh, it's accessible from anywhere, so in an, uh, with the ITS server that was only accessible on VUW campuses, but in the cloud anywhere you've got a web browser you can use it. Um, and it's useful for troubleshooting because you can, we can compare the kind of issues we're having and the bugs we're having in a production environment and versus the cloud, and if, they're both, and if the same issues are common to both, we know we've got an issue with code rather than some other sort of factor. Um, we're also using uh, Amazon Web Services spot pricing, which is not particularly reliable, but for what we do, it's perfectly fine and it's incredibly cheap. Um, but however, we're still going to face those same issues of um, integrating the system further down the track. Um, we've also started to think about how might we, as a university, uh, sort of bring together a number of these different systems that have been proposed uh, or are being developed. And Michael gave a, an excellent talk in the previous session about uh, an object management system that he's proposed. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, we already have a Piction database, which has got mainly marketing images. Um, architecture and design is developing a different system. So we've got this perhaps inevitable application creep happening. Um, and we've started to think as an ins institution, how can we limit this, or at the very least, how can we get all these systems talking to one another? And this is one model that my boss kind of spun up um, where we would basically have a common storage, we would have as much common metadata across those different systems as possible, and all these applications would sit on top of that, and then would use some kind of search aggregator on top of that um, to have one entry point. And whether that is uh, sort of a system run by the library proposed by Michael or wherever, the goal is to have increased searchability, increased functionality, um, and increased access for all the di different uh, digital assets that we have as a university, and they are many. Um, so where are we fitting in the hype cycle, the much uh, promoted Gartner hype cycle that you'll hear about um, uh, already, and again, no doubt? Uh, optimistically, I'm saying we're about here. Um, we've certainly passed the peak of inflated expectations. Uh, hopefully veering, crawling, inching out of the trough of disillusionment towards that slope of enlightenment. Um, the plateau of productivity uh, I was hoping would already be sort of a little closer. Um, but as I said, you know, a litmus test. Is this a cautionary tale or is this an exciting um, sort of example of what can be done? Uh, I'll leave that up to you to answer. But I think one of the, one of the few, th one of the really key things I want to sort of um, pass on are some of the lessons that we've learned uh, during this project. And we do some things very differently now. Um, and so anyone that's interested in going down this path, perhaps this will be useful. Um, first of all, grand designs take time. You know, you get those nice Kevin MacLeod TV shows and they sort of have time lapses and three years sort of going over. I understand that now much more clearly. Um, this is a, a term that I borrowed from Danielle McKinley, who got it from somewhere else, I'm sure. Open source is free, as in kittens. You get them, they're great, but then you have to feed them. Um, so there's not that same upfront cost um, but you have that ongoing costs and also questions about how you're going to support these systems. Um, timing is everything. Uh, I think we've been a little ahead of the curve, at least in terms of where we were placed as an institution three years ago to sort of accommodate this kind of project. Um, timing has also been against us in the sense that we've been relying on funding grants, which are often announced at the start of the year. We're using students who have this window of opportunity over summer. Uh, so we've sort of been... Um, 
I think, hampered a little bit, delayed a little bit by some of those just sort of timing um, arrangements. Uh, and that kind of covers that. Um, I think this is a really key point, and it's a key part of that question mark after Taylor made. The more customized you make the system, the more different sort of tweaks you make to it, um, the more the support becomes problematic. So that's a really key thing to be aware of, is that you know, if you develop something, you have to be uh, willing to support it ongoingly. Um, and so the importance of documentation at every stage of the process is 100% essential. And this is something that needs to be stressed to uh, developers and to project admins. Um, so the complexity of those initial requirements is a two-edged sword because it's meant that it's taken a long time to, to get a system working. But I think it also gives that flexibility to mean it's still current, that we can still find ways and uses um, for the system that mean it's not an outdated thing. So maybe it should have failed fast. Maybe it's a good thing that it hasn't. Um, and so to sort of finish with, hopefully, this will be concluded in the near future. And uh, contact details are up there along with some rather misogynistic but quite hilarious slides that I sort of came across during the course of uh, preparing this presentation. Thank you. Time for a couple of questions. Hi, Matt. Um, sorry, it's a bit of a thought. Um, you don't mention it at all, but I know we're looking at it closely with our system that we're hoping to move to a more modern system. Ours is quite a lot older than yours. <laughs> 1992 sort of thing. Yeah, it's probably yeah, a little older. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, but you haven't talked about the migration of the current data. Right. Because that is a huge, huge part for us. And I think it can't be underestimated, and you didn't really talk about there's, it. At there's all. a lot I didn't talk about. Yes, no, um, good question. So, um, this is another, another one of the things that was a bit annoying in some ways, but also really fortuitous. Collective access, we will be migrating that data to, has just released a new version, um, 1.4, well, when I say just at the start of the year, um, which really made uh, map, mapping that data input much easier. Uh, so, um, basically, we've got all our the visual resource collection, which is a few thousand um, catalogued items um, in an Excel spreadsheet, and it's a pretty easy crosswalk, and we're just working through that mapping import process at the moment. Um, I'll let you know how we go. But it looks on, on paper to be quite a simple process. You can configure the, that sort of import uh, quite, quite customizably. And give, given it took three years and you're still just past the trough of disallowance, <laughs> um, if you could go back three years, would you still take the heavily customized two pieces of open source things and put them together approach rather than maybe a, an off the shelf something con configured and, and, and compromise a little bit on, on what you were trying to achieve and, and be on the plateau of, <laughs> can't remember what was the plateau of, doing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Productivity, yes. Um, I think, yeah, and this is once again, you know, this is a system that was architected by someone else. Uh, uh, what I would do differently in retrospect would be just to install and implement the cataloging tool. And then, um, because one of the sort of upshots is that in that period of development, there's been, there's continued to be a lack of cataloging. So in retrospect, it would have been better to install that open source cataloging tool get that up and running, continue to use it as we had been with Vernon's, and then sort of see if we could graft in the sort of teaching presentation side of things. Um, I guess the, the, the way that we went made sense at the time, which was to see, achieve a proof of concept and see how it could be implemented. Um, and there have been a whole lot of reasons, which I haven't really gone into detail, why that's been delayed. Um, and it's partly just having limited funds and having part-time employees working on it. But yeah, in retrospect, there would definitely be things I would personally do differently. Yeah. Happy to chat with anyone about this later as well. I guess that leads on to the question of long-term sustainability for the whole thing. Yes, yes, it does. Um, I, I think that the sort of the climate has changed a little bit. And I know that in, that in the time of that, since that initial inception, I think there's been a much more heightened awareness about the need for these kinds of systems and there are other systems that we're aware of now trying to do that same thing. And maybe that 
this gets cannibalized, we use part of this functionality and that more of, more of it sits with the library, say for example, rather than within a, a particular school or program in the university. Um, it's, it's an open question, um, but I hope that I've at least showed that there are options that you have in this open source era to sort of, to come up with your own system and um, I think in, in a slightly more resourced environment, you know, it could have been done much quickly and perhaps be a bit more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Just